And you start the recording on yours, and away we go. Well, welcome everyone. We are so thrilled that you've taken the time to be with us today. Um, we know that it's a very busy time of year, and uh, but uh, we're happy that you could join us. My name is Eva D'Agostini. I'm with the Centre of Excellence for Behaviour Management, and I have my two team members here, uh, Catherine Cora and Martine Demers. Good morning. Uh, Martine and Catherine um, uh, work at the uh, at Riverside School Board as behavior consultants on the days that they're not with the Center of Excellence. And I am a school psychologist for who's worked for many, many years in schools, uh, and I'm the coordinator. We thought that uh, in, in the spring when COVID hit, we thought, oh my goodness, we're going to have to do something different in August. And so we put out a proposal to the different boards and got a good response and said, we'll do offer these days. Uh, the, good, the good thing about this is that, uh, or the, let's, let's start with what's not so good about it. What's not so good about it is we don't get to see your faces. We don't get to feel your presence. We don't get to be with you. Um, and we do miss that. On the other hand, the good thing about this is that people all the way from the Gaspé, and yesterday we had someone from Les Ides de la Madeleine, all the way through to Gatineau, um, all over the province, uh, get to join us. Uh, and so this way we can spread out the information to a much broader population, much broader group of people. Um, and so we're very thrilled that you can be with us. And um, we're going to go straight through uh, until, uh, when, you know, right through until 11 o'clock. Uh, we will leave about uh, 20 minutes for Q&A. So if you have any questions or comments that you want to make, please put them into the chat box and, and we will monitor them. And uh, I guess we'll just get started. Let me just share my screen. And away we go. So the topic this morning, uh, understanding the emotional world of our children in COVID times and how it affects their behavior and what we can do to help them, a big topic. And we all know that the world has shifted. Um, for me, it was March the 12th to March the 13th. Everything changed. And I think for all of us here in Quebec, because that was the day in which most school boards already closed their schools down. And on the, the next Monday, our schools were closed and things were different. And with this shift, we don't know. We don't know if it will ever get back to the way it was before. Probably not, because this is a big shift. Uh, this is something that has not gone away. The virus is still there. And, uh, and we're having to cope with a different world. And one of the things we're going to talk about today is how we as human beings are able to adapt to things that are so different. We all know that the, uh, it's stirring a wave of emotions in us. Uh, all of you, all of you are full of these emotions. The children are full of emotions. And we really are ne needing to actually deal with that. One of the things as well that, that those of us that are in education, and by the way, we have people from daycare and high school and elementary and, and uh, all the different levels uh, who are here with us today, is that what's happening now in September is not the vision of school that we hold in our hearts. And this, sent, this was sent to, me, uh, or sent to us by Valerie Kaya, who's a vice principal at St. John's Elementary School, and it really struck me that we had all these plans, even in March, you were already thinking about what you were going to do in September, how you were going to do things differently, how are you going to find another way of, of, of presenting that curriculum, of presenting those ideas, uh, just what you'd learned in that year with this particular group of students, you were going to pass on to the next group of students. And all of a sudden, we've been stopped dead in our tracks. What we do, how we do, how we interact with the children, we've had to rethink that. Uh, the focus of today's present, this morning's presentation is about dealing with the emotional fallout from this. Um, and you can see as well that there's, there's, there's the heart, which means the caring that you have for your children, but also the tears, which is the grieving about how things have changed. Um, but the, uh, the thing is that, uh, that we need to move forward and we will move forward um, and figuring out how we're going to do things differently. So the session this afternoon is going to focus more on what you do in the classroom and today is going to be more about understanding the children and interacting with them. Um, one of the things that, uh, that we need to know is that there's an awful lot of behavior that's going to happen uh, and this behavior is actually the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it is what we see as a result of 
what's going on in our emotional world, which is underneath the tip of the iceberg. Um, and it's really important that we understand that the emotional world, and now the neuroscience um, is really showing us and helping us to understand that these emotions and the emotional world is very real and something that we really have to pay attention to. But usually it, the way that it's expressed is through behavior. And so we're gonna try and make those links for you. What we're looking at is where do these behaviors come from? How can we change them? A big question we're going to look at is, are our children going to be traumatized, traumatized or have mental health problems because of COVID? Um, and, and what can we do to help? And that's going to be basically the, the, taught, the purpose of what we're, we're presenting today. A lot of what we're going to do is to help you to see in a world that has changed dramatically. Now, the things that we're going to be talking about are there as well in our regular world. And these are things that many of you intuitively knew. Uh, you, had, you have a good sense of these. Um, <laughs> I've had the honor of working with teachers who've been in the field for 30 years and, uh, and also working with um, young people that are being trained to be teachers at McGill and Concordia. And I'm always amazed at the intuition, the perception, the capacity to see, the capacity to understand that is innate to all of you. But when we get into a circumstance in which everything is changing, when everything is moving, uh, we actually have to move into consciousness uh, things that we normally just do innately. And so part of what we're doing today as well is just helping you to see things from a different perspective in a very conscious kind of way, because the way that we see will actually make a difference in terms of what we do. We're going to talk about certain emotions that fuel certain kinds of behaviors. So it would be easy to see a behavior as being rude or as someone is being lazy. But when we understand what's underneath that, then we might have compassion because of course, in this particular moment in time with COVID-19, we're experiencing the similar emotions as well and they're gonna affect our behavior as well. So the idea here is that, is that seeing allows us to have compassion, to come alongside and to work with. It doesn't mean we have to accept that behavior, but we can work with the fundamentals of the behavior so that the behavior can naturally change. So we'll look at resistance, we're going to look at emotions and behavior, then the role of play in emotional well-being and getting out emotion, and the importance of tears. So these are the topics that we're going to look at today. We're going to start with resistance because um, there are many things that we're being told and we we have been told over the past months that we have to do to take care of ourselves and to keep other people safe and to be able to walk through and maneuver all, all that we're being told to do and all that we're needing to um, adjust to. And the counter will instinct is very much that, that piece that gets triggered in us when we're feeling that there is um, there is there is that it's a defensive reaction that we have. So the pushing back against the will of others of of being told what to do we don't always like that. And there's a part where we still need to do what we are told to do, um, even though we're not comfortable with it. And one of the big issues that we have with heading back to school is what are the different parameters that are being given by public health that we need to follow. Um, you know what what is happening, the mask wearing, uh, the hand washing. There are so many things, and and some schools. Many of our schools in Quebec did get back to school in May. However, the greater Montreal area did not. So different experiences for everybody coming back to school this August. However, even if we, for those who did go back, what they're coming back to is totally different again, um, and more adjustment is required. So we need to expect that there's that energy in us, that the instinct, our, our counter will instinct can be triggered. And um, what we really need to hold on to here is that it's not we are choosing to be on the defensive or that kids will be defensive. It's that it is a, it's a, it's not a learned response. It's an emotional reaction. And, and that is really our key message is that it's not something that kids are choosing to do. They're, they haven't learned this. It's an emotional reaction based in instinct. And that's a piece that we're going to come back and we're going to bring back because that's really an essential piece for us to know. <clears throat> the, the, excuse me, the resistance is very much that desire to push back. And we can see that in all relationships. So we're specifically in this presentation going to look at the adult child relationship, where the adult being in the lead and how is the, ch how, how is the child, how are the children responding to that. But we can totally make that comparison and look at it from employer, employee, um, if you're, you know, with your spouse, even with yourself, you know, when you're looking to, you know, I need to eat healthy, get in shape and lose a couple of pounds. 
we have a lot of counter will with ourselves where we kind of push back against our own ideas and, and, and some of that resistance that we put in. Um, I think one of my favorite ones to look at is sales and consumer where you're going into a store and you're intending to buy something and you need it, but just how they approach you can be enough as a turnoff where you're triggered of no, that's not where I'm going to buy it. It's not how I'm going to buy it. It's not the brand I'm going to buy. And you end up walking out feeling like, well, they can't tell me what to do. And even though you needed something, you realize you're walking out of the store and it's like, I thought I was coming to buy, but I guess it didn't, not today. So some of that, when we feel that in us is really when we understand that instinct that gets triggered, we can also start to really have a good, um, a good, a good lens on understanding and seeing it in kids. So attachment and counter will are really two keys that come together that when attachment is strong, the counter will will diminish. So the more that we prime the attachment instincts that we engage them, then we're naturally moved to please those that we're attached to. So if kids are very well attached to us and we prime those attachment instincts, we will get less resistance from them, but also that they will want to do many things for us. And, and part of how we can work at reducing the triggering of the counter will instinct is really to collect them before we give them directions to do anything. And collecting we mean by getting their eyes, their smile, their nod, getting into attachment with them, activating that and, and, and put, giving that as kind of like the forefront before giving directions. So that can really help to reduce some of the pushback that we'll get with them. <clears throat> Why does a child oppose an adult to whom who or she is attached? Because you can have kids where you, and it could be your own kids too, <clears throat> for those of you who are parents who are going to say, hmm, why is it that all of a sudden I'm getting this pushback where I thought things were really good? What's going on? And the child may be attached to something else or to someone else at that time. So it doesn't mean that the relationship isn't good. It just means that it hasn't been activated at that time. <clears throat> And when we're looking at students in school, is it might be that they were having a conversation with their friends. They might be involved in activity or a game. Um, when we're thinking of masks, I'm going to be bringing this back a couple of times, but you know, if parents are not in agreement with the mask wearing, you may have more issues with those children about wearing masks at school. And depending on the age group that they're in, for some that it's now like required, um, that what might be something that we'll need to work on. And we're going to talk further into the presentation is how can we kind of maneuver around that so we're not putting pressure head on because that won't help us either. The other piece that we need to know is that counter will can be held at bay and that it can go underground for a little bit, um, but it will reemerge when the child is in a safe place. And for some kids, school with their teacher might be that safe place or it might be back at home after. So it really there is, it depends on the students and depends where. The counter will can be kept at bay by alarm that they will do things that you ask them to do because they're complying to be safe. Um, there is a part of them that does want to do well, but there's a part where also when there is too much, there are too many have tos, is we need to expect and that's the key thing is expect that there will be some pushback because if we if we think that everything will go smoothly we're actually giving ourselves an illusion that will not happen there have been many things that have, we've been told to do and and this is a piece that we really need to consider and what we're going to see or may see in children is that we may have some who will not want to work we may have some who will refuse outright to do work we may have some who are not going to follow directions as expected. We may have some who do the opposite of what is being asked. And you may have some who are just not tuned in and they're unmotivated and they look lethargic. Now, the key is that the instinct has been triggered. There have been too many have tos and it's, it's, it's the way their brain is doing a pushback. So we need to do a dance around that, not go at it head on. So we'll look at how we're gonna work with that. So the drama of the stuck child encounter will is they can get stuck in this, but it doesn't mean they're stuck in it all the time. So the key is when we know these three steps and keep this in mind is it's like a play in three acts. First one is when kids get stuck, often adults will start pushing. When kids feel pushed, they put on the brakes. And where it comes dramatic is when the kids get stuck in their resistance and the adults get stuck in their persistence. And this is where it can really go sour because if kids are feeling pushed and the adult keeps pushing, there will be more 
push back. It's a bit like a kid not only putting on the brakes, but if we keep pushing and they get stuck in their resistance and we keep pushing, it's as though they're also yanking the handbrake and more pressure will just provoke a situation to explode. So the key is how can we do it differently to manage and to maneuver? Because there are times where kids will need to do what we're asking them to do. How can we work it that it won't feel so coercive to them? And hopefully we don't so outright trigger their counter will instinct. Because once it's triggered, it will take a while before it, it, it diffuses and they're no longer in that counter will instinct that's activated. So maintaining the lead and the counter in face of counter will, the key here is we need to stay in charge even if we can't control the whole situation. So even though you want to be the boss of it all, there's a part where if you keep going at it in that direction, it may and will not work. So the key is then we need to be that, that, that leader that will just decide to go in a different direction and you make it as it's your decision. I have decided that we are now going to, and you switch it completely, and you switch it for everybody. So this way we're not pushing on a kid and we're not provoking. We are actually switching gears and, and just rerouting. It's as though there's, you know, there's a pylon on the road and you just say, well, we need to take a right turn here. You know, there's an obstacle. We need to take a right turn and we're continuing and keep the flow moving. The more that we can keep the flow moving, the better that it is. So we have a three-pronged approach to help to handle counter well. And what we want to see is our, 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 our core piece with counter will is felt or perceived coercion. And the key thing here is that um, coercion um, is, is, is that, that energy of feeling that pressure coming out. But the key thing is, is when we see counter will, it is not always negative. And there's actually a part that's really beautiful to see. It's where we see the signs of emergence in a child. And that's part of good, healthy development, where they want to do things on their own, where they are growing into having their own minds, their own ideas. I want to do it my way. And there's a part there that's absolutely beautiful, except that if you're wanting them to do something and they're going to do it their way and how they want and when they want, it doesn't feel so beautiful on the part of the adult. But there is a part here that we want to appreciate because there is a good sign here. Um, you want to see this coming out in kids. We just would like to adjust some of the timing sometimes. Um, when we increase attachment, it really helps to reduce that coercive feeling for them. So part of the key piece in working with counter will is we need to look attachable. If we're coming on with a very gruff face and a, and a rough tone of voice or kind of like a stern tone of voice, we're not very attachable. That will increase the coercion felt and will make it harder to work with that student. On the emergent side, if we see that that's a piece that we want to work, and this is actually a very good way to work counter will, is to offer them choices. Now, the key thing is when they're in this mode, they don't realize that by you offering choices, that you're actually the person who's in control because you have decided what are the choices that you're offering. And for kids there, they think they're in the full driver's seat because they're actually choosing one of the choices that you've made. Um, if they want something that you haven't offered, you can just say that's not available right now, but we'll keep it in mind. Or you might decide that you are changing your choices, but then you name, I've decided that, yeah, this is a good choice. So this is also an option. But the key thing is you are permitting it. So even though they think they've won, technically they haven't because you're still the adult in the lead, but we don't need to tell them that part, okay? So the other part is, um, Coercion, like I mentioned, tone of voice is huge. If there's a sense of them feeling that there's some gruffness or there's a shift in your tone, some of our students with special needs, high needs, high sensitivity are very, very sensitive to this, okay? The look on our faces, the tone of our voice, even the stance in our body. So we need to be careful and aware of that because that can make a huge difference in how they perceive the coercion, because that's a really a big piece with counter will, is the perceived and felt coercion. So we may be coming off very softly, but if they're perceiving it differently, the, the, the counter will instinct does get triggered. So how can we handle resistance? In our role as, as the adult, whether you're a teacher, an educator, a principal, a coach, a technician, an attendant, a counselor, a professional of any type working with kids, we need to be patient. This is the big piece. Um, and in the context of what we're living with a pandemic, we're going to need 
to be extremely patient. We're going to need to find that place in us where even at times where you go, I don't think I could do this, is we're going to need to dig deep and we're going to need to have moments where we're going to need to find that even though when we think we've got no more. Because if we go at it with a different tone of voice and a different stance, we will actually be giving ourselves a much harder time with a child, but also potentially with a whole group of kids. So we need to adjust our view. We need to understand that we need to take things less personally. You may say one thing that triggers them, but what we need to remember in this context is that there have been months of have-tos. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, there's a list of have-tos. You can't go to the grocery store to pick up popsicles without having to wear a mask, wash your hands, stand in line, and all you wanted was popsicles to have fun. So even when you're wanting to do something enjoyable, and I've had people like, you know, go out for a picnic and different things, and it's like, they're like, there's so many things we have to do. And yeah, so we need to be careful and just be cognizant of that. that there's so many things. So it's not all about us. Yes, we're important, but it's not all about us. We need to recognize that it's instinct that it's involved. It's not, they're not choosing this. The trigger has been done. The instinct has been triggered and things are there. A huge piece is we need to aim to do no harm. If we push, we can cause harm. That's nobody's intention, but we need to be aware of it. That when we see resistance, we need to cue in right away that we need to slow down so that we are not moving forward and causing harm. We need to adjust our stance. We need to normalize and convey that we expected pushback. That's okay. I don't like being told what to do all the time. And when we normalize it, kids go, even the big people too? It's like, mm -hmm. I don't like being told what to do all the time. So how could we work around that? We need to make room for the child to display their own will, placing the child in charge whenever possible. Around masks, I would look at having a variety of them. Which one do you want today? It's not an issue of do you want to wear a mask? It's which one do you want today? So we've already taken it further where they're already in the process of going to put on a mask, but take your pick, which color, which design. So let's have fun with that. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Great. Thanks, Martine. So big questions. Are our children going to have mental health problems or be traumatized because of COVID-19? Well, not necessarily, because if we understand how emotion works, if we understand what our role as adult is in, uh, in, in allowing emotion to be expressed, um, we actually um, can do a lot to help and make sure that, uh, that this particular situation doesn't cause a trauma for our children or, or cause difficulty for our children. Um, rather than talking about mental health, um, I, we prefer to talk about emotional well-being. And if we understand how emotions work, we can actually keep children in that state of emotional well-being. It doesn't mean that we're going to keep them from feeling, you know, all of the emotions that are difficult. Um, that's not, emotional well-being is about have, having and feeling all of our emotions. But if we understand how emotions work, then we can help the process. And this is part of what it is that we're wanting to share with you today is what can realistically be done in school to help the emotional world of our children. So that that they're less affected by something that is pretty scary as COVID is. A uh, lot of neuroscience right now on emotion, the study of emotion. Uh, there's so much information coming out that it's hard to keep on top of it. Uh, I've been in the psychology field for long enough, for a long, long time to know that um, for a long time, we just ignored emotion. Uh, we thought that it was a nuisance variable. Uh, we thought, well, if we just thought right, everything would feel right. Um, but now we're understanding the role of emotion, what emotions do for us, and they are absolutely essential. So the first thing we've learned is that emotions need to be expressed to preserve healthy functioning and well-being. They're supposed to rise up and through our children. Um, we know, of course, that when that happens, it's not necessarily uh, a fun thing. It can be kind of a messy thing. But a child who is full of emotion is a child who is living what they need to live. Um, that it's not a problem. Emotions are not a problem. Any of the emotions, and again, in the perspective that we're working with, we don't see any emotion as a positive emotion or a negative emotion or a, a dark emotion or a light emotion. Emotions are there and they are not a problem. 
But of course, the way in which they're expressed may be a cause of problems. And we do work with children and with ourselves to find a responsible way of sharing what is going on inside of us. But we need to acknowledge what is actually going on inside of us. Emotions really need to flow for children to grow because one of the things that our brain needs is our brain needs relief and, and, and a sense of, of everything is okay. But without emotions moving through, we end up getting stuck. And when we get stuck, not only do we not improve emotionally, but we also, it actually affects the development of the brain. So how is the brain meant to work? Well, if any of you have heard um, uh, Dr. Regelina Melrose, I remember the first time I heard her, I was completely taken by what she said, because she said the brain has three main purposes. And then she said, survival, survival, survival. That's only one. Well, no, it has survival of itself, survival of its genetic makeup, and survival of its offspring. And we're all in that right now. I mean, especially the survival of the self and the survival of our offspring. Our brain, our emotional brain, and, and we call that part of the emotional brain the limbic system, is, is the part of our brain that is making sure, at least for most of us, that we're paying a, still paying attention to a virus that we can't even see. And how does this all work? Well, we have an amygdala, which is basically our smoke detector. Uh, in, and, and in the very beginning, in, in, in March and in April, um, because we knew so little about the virus, how it was transmitted, uh, and so on and so forth, most of us were in a very high state of alarm. If we could, and, and people are, by the way, now we can, vi we can do imaging of the brain. Most of us, we would have seen that our, our amygdala, which is normally, you know, uh, like a smoke detector, it pays attention to everything in the world, actually started getting more activated because we didn't know what it was that was threatening us. As I say, we have a little bit more knowledge of that right now. So the amygdala is a smoke detector. It says there's trouble out there, there's trouble out there. It connects to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus connects to the sympathetic nervous system and it basically puts us into activation mode so that we can keep ourselves and keep our loved ones safe and uh, many of you uh, were at that time surprised because you were at home and therefore maybe under a little bit less stress you didn't have to go up places you were probably extremely tired well because the system was very highly activated and in a moment i'm going to show you some of the biochemicals that we've been all of us have been dealing with in our system the third part of the limbic system uh, is the hippocampus and you'll see how see how all these three are kind of very close together hippocampus is involved with memory now when all is going well the hippocampus's job is to take what we've learned in a day and pass it through into our long-term memory so that we can access it and use all of the wonderful things that we've learned especially at school uh, in in you know in the rest of our lives or in in, in the rest of the year but when we are in survival mode, the hippocampus is actually uh, basically used for survival. And so one of the things we need to understand about what's going to be happening in the next little while, um, and also might be happening for us, is we have less ability to remember all of the things that we need to remember because our hippocampus is constantly being sort of sidetracked by this survival mode. And so again, um, as things go on, you might start thinking, well, why aren't the children remembering? Why aren't they remembering the simple instructions that I've given them? Or why aren't they remembering the things that I taught them? Well, because the hippocampus is still being somewhat affected by the circumstance that we're living. So we need to understand a bit about us as human beings, what is it that affects us the most? And if we think about survival and survival of those whom we love, well, the biggest, um, biggest menace to our survival is facing separation. And with COVID-19, we are absolutely in having to face the fact that we could get sick, that our children could get sick, that our parents could get sick, and, and of course, sadly, uh, someone could die. And we have three basic emotions. Uh, this is proposed by Dr. Gordon Neufeld, but has been also, again, verified by the neuroscience, that when we are in facing separation, there's three emotional reactions that we have. All of these you have experienced in the last few months. The first one, we don't even actually have an emotional word for it. It's not, doesn't usually show up on any of the emotion, emotions charts. Um, Pan, I think Panksepp called it seeking. Uh, Dr. Neufeld calls it pursuit. So in other words, what it means is that 
when we think we're going to be separated from someone, the, one of the first things we do is we move to restore proximity. Um, I know I ended up calling people that I hadn't called for, for months, you know, um, and, and this desire to, to restore proximity actually results uh, in very good behavior. So one of the things we're going to find is that when the children come, come to school, when they first see you for the first couple of weeks, they're going to really want to please you. They've been missing the school. They've been wanting to get back to school. They want their new teacher to like them. Uh, they want their daycare, daycare uh, a a person who takes uh, daycare, take care of them. They want the adults to like them. So they're going to move to, to, to make sure that they do all the things to please you because that will ensure that you're, you're going to take care of them and they're going to be in relationship with you. Um, and so this is, as I say, this is not something we usually talk about very much, but it, actually many of you have experienced this because that first two weeks of school, um, we often call that the honeymoon period. And if we understand that this is the emotion that causes that honeymoon to happen. What we need to realize, though, is that when, uh, when we're, especially in this time right now, when, we're, when there's this, a lot of separation in the back of our mind and our, our, our limbic system, our emotional brain is concerned about separation, there are two other parallel emotions. One of them, of course, and we've experienced this very consciously now, is alarm. Oh my goodness, what's going to happen? And when we feel alarm, it moves us to caution and to avoid that which alarms. Um, my husband uh, and I always have this little to-do about washing of hands. Uh, this was well before COVID. Um, and there were many times when I would say to him, did you wash your hands? And he would get very upset with me because he thought I was being too picky. Oh my goodness, the minute COVID kicked in, he was washing his hands. So alarm moved him to caution and washing of the hands was a thing that he had to do. A very good thing. Not a comfortable emotion, but an emotion that is absolutely necessary for our survival. The third emotion is frustration. So when things aren't working, we're actually moved to try and effect change and to fix the problem. And certainly uh, in this moment, um, all of us are feeling that there are things that need to change. And so there are petitions going on around uh, by teachers, by doctors, by different people who are not in agreement with what the ministry is doing, and I'm not going to weigh on it one way or another, but this emotion moves us to do something about it, to fix the problem. Of course, frustration can also move us to attack, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but these three emotions are there. Now, what we need to remember is that when an emotion is activated, so when the amygdala senses something's happening, I need to do something about it, and it, and it connects with the, the hypothalamus, now what happens is our nervous system gets activated. And how does it get activated? Well, we get an increase of cortisol, an increase of adrenaline, an increase of norepinephrine, uh, increase of growth hormone. And so we basically are getting ready to move, our heart, our, our blood vessels constrict, uh, we have different ways of our stomach gets affected, uh, we have an increase in heart rate and breathing, blood diverts to the muscles, so we're getting ready to do something, right? And so we're in this active mode and it's happening physiologically. And one of the things, again, that we need to recognize is when these hormones and, and neuro, uh, biochemicals are activated, it actually causes a lot of fatigue. And so certainly in today's session, but also in the session or this morning session, but also in the one this afternoon, one of the biggest things we talk about is just recognizing and understanding that the fatigue means we can't get as much done as we would like to do. And so we need to honor that and respect that and just basically take things more slowly um, as we start this new year. Um, and so that action potential of emotion, once that gets activated, it's gotta go somewhere. It's got to go somewhere, and that's what we mean. It's got to get out. And what we're, ha what we're seeing here is that, is that emotion is basically underneath. It's underneath. And for example, if we take alarm, when we go into alarm, adrenaline, cortisol, heart rate get activated. But what's really fascinating is that emotion is not the same as feeling. Emotion is what's going on underneath. Feeling is what happens when that emotion comes to our consciousness? So the, there's something going on, something is triggering an alarm in us. And if we're able to, if, our, if, our, if, uh, if we allow ourselves to experience that emotion, it will come out as a feeling. And the feeling, of course, that is directly linked to alarm is I'm scared. 
And this is one of the things I'm noticing when people were doing interviews on TV with parents, uh, especially about their children and their children's mental health. And some of the parents were saying, well, you know, my child is ta constantly talking about being scared. I'm so worried for, for my child's mental health. No, actually a child who can relate the alarm to a feeling and talk about it is a child who is doing well emotionally because they're still in touch with their emotions. Of course, as parents and as adults, we don't like to hear the word. We don't want our children to be scared. But when we're able to acknowledge that and notice that and talk about that, uh, this is what we call moving emotion through. Okay, it's because, and we're going to talk about how to help that emotion to go through. So ch children and people who are talking about being scared, that's exactly how this needs to be working. But sometimes it can get overwhelming. And what's really fascinating is our brain is wired to help us when things are overwhelming as well. And so what can happen is that it protects us. It can kind of suppress this, 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 the feelings because it can get overwhelming because when we feel all of this alarm inside of us, it can get overwhelming or it can distract us from what we need to do. Many of you are feeling high alarm about going back to school, but you've got a job to do. You've got to go in, you've got to work, you've got to deal with things, you've got to make do with the circumstance that you've been given. And your brain actually is doing that. It is basically pushing down that alarm, basically not allowing you to feel it in the moment and, and moving you forward. And of course, why does that do that? Well, because we don't want to be overwhelmed by what makes us feel too vulnerable or too wounded. Um, and, and overwhelm, when we're feeling overwhelmed, it means that we can't function. Uh, and so it's important that our brain is able to do that. Um, in, again, pre-COVID times, you might have had uh, a really a big fight with, one, with your spouse at home and you get to school and it's, and it, again, not consciously, you're not saying I'm not going to think about it, or you can also say that as well, but it's like your brain just kind of puts the, the, the you know, the, the valve on it. And, you, and one of your friends might say at the beginning of the day, uh, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Same friend comes to you at the end of the day when now it's okay, now I don't have to function, comes to you and says, are you really okay? Now it moves through. And that's exactly how this, this barrier is meant to work, is that we put it on when we need it, but we also have to take it off sometime. And what so we need to understand that when the brain is constantly in this protection mode, that all this energy needs to go somewhere. And we call that state more emotion, but less feeling. And the experience of that state is stress. When there's way too much emotion going on and not enough time to do feeling, then we feel stressed. And by the way, any of you, again, that have children at home know that at the end of the day, sometimes they want to do a lot of feelings, a lot of stuff needs to come out and it takes a lot of time. And right now, probably for the next two to three weeks, all of us are going to be in this stress mode and we can handle a certain amount of stress for a while. What we need to realize though, is all this energy, all this, all this emotional um, activation, if it can't be expressed in an emotional way, is going to be expressed behaviorally. And this is what we need to understand is that it will come out, but it will come out in ways that are a bit unusual or not necessarily unusual, but not doesn't seem to be quite related to the experience. So if we are not able to feel our, our alarm, we might be quite inattentive, not because our, our attention is actually being hijacked by worrying about what it is that, that is, is making us unsafe. And so we're all over the place. Or we can be agitated, okay? Because all that adrenaline makes us wanna move, okay? Um, it can result in hyperactivity. It can also result, as I mentioned before, in poor memory. Our, our hippocampus is not able to do its job. We will be fatigued because having this stuff swirling around in ourselves is exhausting. Sometimes we can actually feel numb. Uh, and, and, and that worries us because we know we should be feeling something, but I'm not feeling anything at all. Of course, sometimes we really admire those people. Oh, well, she's not worried. Oh, he's not worried. Oh, look at, how, look at how this child is coping. It's not really coping. It's actually numbness. It can also result in obsessions and compulsions. Um, so over, over worry about washing hands, over worry about whatever. And, and of course, right now with the COVID, it's good to have some of these obsessions and compulsions, but they can get very, very exhausting. And of course, sometimes it can result in panic. If we look at the emotion of frustration, same kind of thing. The actual feeling when things are not working, what we need to be saying is, it's not working for me. 
things have got to change. I want to do things differently. I don't like this. Okay, so those are all good. And when we're expressing those things, now we are moving forward in emotion. But when our brain is protecting us, uh, again, we end up with that more emotion and less feeling. The way that it kind of leaks out from us is through these different kinds of behaviors. And so we get impatience when there really shouldn't be impatience. We get abruptness. Uh, again, because there's just this, this sense of I need to change something and I can't change it. And so there's an abruptness. There can be rudeness, irritability, obviously physical outbursts. And we have some of our children, and we'll talk about this, Catherine will talk about it in a moment, who have so much frustration in their system. It's got to come out somewhere, come out through tantrums. But it also can come out through fatigue and come out also through depression. So Catherine will take us through the next bit. Wonderful. And so uh, following up with what Eva was just mentioning and looking at all of those behaviors that can come out both from uh, alarm and from frustration, we can see how these behaviors can be very messy, very noisy, chaotic, how they're destabilizing for us as adults, they're alienating um, and can also be wounding. Um, and so understanding that um, you know, especially in a time like now when children are high stress as well, um, they're in survival mode. And so being in survival mode, in, attachment is even more important than the now where they need to feel safe being with us. And if they are in tune with us and pick up that their behavior affects us, pushes us away and, and alienates us, then what will happen is that they, they will dampen that emotion in order to protect the relationship in order to, um, because then they'll feel like the relationship is conditional on them being good rather than them expressing all of these emotions that they have. Um, and so understanding that the word depression here is not in the clinical sense it's the idea of the flattening of emotion um and so the brain will do this the brain like eva was explaining about you know the flap that goes on top there uh you know when we have a job to do and that we need to move through our day that we're able to suppress those emotions and to not bring them to feelings well our, our children can do the exact same thing um but for the purpose of protecting the relationship and so, of course, as adults, we are, are uh, well, we have good intentions, we're well-meaning, we want to help, we try to fix things, and sometimes without realizing it, uh, inadvertently, we say things that has a judgment and that will affect emotions and that will suppress the feeling. Um, and so these are examples that what we might say to a child, stop yelling, stop crying, stop whining, calm down, don't be silly, there's nothing to be afraid of. Why are you crying? Why are you so angry? Um, be happy, uh, you know, and, and so on. And as you can see, the tone that I'm using right now is a little rough, but even if you were to use a very sweet, sweet tone with a child where you would say something like, oh, honey, why are you crying? Um, it, sometimes, even if you have the right tone, it's the underlying message behind that. What is the child picking up from what it is that we're saying to them? Are they understanding that the, the emotion that, that they're experiencing is not acceptable and that the behavior that they're, that is attached to that needs needs to be suppressed um, and there's very um uh, secondary consequences to the suppression of emotions and so on the one hand I mentioned the word depression what happens when we're putting that lid on top of the expression of emotion is that there's a flat line that happens and of course short term it's not that it's not a big issue that we're not expressing because it's not the time or it's not the place to be uh, you know out there and letting out all of these feelings um, but if if it never happens if there's never a good time or place for the child to be able to have that release, it can have a, a, a quite a negative impact on, on the, the system and also on, on the development of the child. Again, here, another type of uh, consequence that can be related to the suppressing, uh, the suppressing of the emotions is what we call displacement. Um, and so I'll give you an example, you know, a child who's very frustrated because something's not working and that they want to kick or scream because that situation's not working for them um, will feel threatened because they feel like they cannot kick or scream because then they'll get into trouble. So they'll hold that back. And what's happened there is that the alarm um, of getting it into trouble or the pursuit to want to please the adult has displaced the frustration. Um, but we need to keep in mind that when emotions displace themselves, they don't disappear. 
emotions are like electricity. It's not because we've left them aside that they'll dissipate on their own. They're, they stay in the system and they need a release at some point. And so understanding that sometimes we'll notice with some students that it seems like it comes out of nowhere, where there's this, this emotion that doesn't seem related to the situation. And perhaps it's due to the dis displacement. Um, and more than that, you know, if the child's accumulating situation after situation, all of this frustration, at some point it's going to blow. Um, and so just keeping in mind the nature of emotions and how they work, they need to be released at some point in time. Um, this is an imagery to explain how frustration works, the energy of frustration. This is uh, from the Neufeld Institute. And so understanding that when you're triggered and that the, the frustration comes down the pike, um, you know, on the one hand, if we're able to fix the situation and change it, whatever it was that was frustrating us, and we'll feel better about it and move on. But if it's not possible to change it, and there's so many things, you know, think about COVID uh, and would return back to school, um, you know, having to wear the mask, having to, you know, the distance, and all of these, these parameters that children will be very frustrated with and won't be able to change, then the next thing around is if they're able to accept the fact that these things won't change and adapt to them, uh, that would be wonderful, but that requires for there to be a vulnerability and, and an in tuned with disappointment and, and an acceptance on an emotional level. And so if that doesn't happen because there's no time and place for, the, for that emotional um, that, that emotional journey to happen, then the next step is that it might go throughout the attack where the child might, ha might have an impulse or a desire to hurt. And so us as adults, um, what, where we can play into this is that right before where the attack comes out is can we allow um, to, to create an opportunity for release, for venting? Um, you know, and of course, in the classroom is not the time or place, but could we schedule, and we'll talk more about this later, but you know, schedule for certain students a time or place, and it doesn't have to be an intervention. We don't need to wait until they blow up in order for us to intervene. If we know the child well enough and we know what triggers them, we could set this up in a prevention mode where we do this to schedule it in. Um, and so the challenge is that when dealing with problem rooted in emotion, uh, there's, there's ex we're trying to tr set it up where there's expression that is allowed without repercussion. And so as a caring adult, how can we help the emotion find its way through? Um, and for example, we can say something to the child like, I see that, that you're having an emotion uh, in you that needs to get out, or, or here, let me help you find a way um, that won't get you into trouble. Um, and so, uh, you know, how us as adults, we can be that place. Um, uh, talking about different ways that we can help adults, I know the government talked a lot about uh, the RTI model and addressing uh, the student population at different levels depending on their needs. Uh, and so at the first level for, for the mass population of students, um, play would be the key here. Um, you know, how can, can we set up some times and, and, and occasions where children can through play release some of this pent up emotions and they need this more than ever. Um, you will see we, we've um, provided for you a resource guide uh, where we've got examples of activities. Martin will go through these, so I won't name them now, um, but how can be different ways to release through play. At the second level, um, so then it's for the, that second tier they need to play out the emotion. So it's more than just using play as a release. It's how can we on an emotional level play, play them out. And at the third level for our most challenging students, how can we set up in their schedule a time and place? Um, and for example, in some of our schools, we've got something called an emotions room. Um, and so this is a picture, an example. It doesn't need to be like this. It doesn't need to be a very big space either. It's just a place that's very warm and inviting where there's no judgment, there's no repercussions. We're not punishing the child. This is not a timeout room. This is a place where the child can go to just release, to vent. Um, and the idea is um, to have lots and lots of materials. Uh, it's not that we need to have a lot of material. What I mean by lots and lots is the range of materials. Because of course, uh, different children have different bents. Some children kick, some children scream. Um, I mean, even us as adults, we each have our own kind of default and when we're really frustrated of how we acted out. Um, and so to provide lots of materials and, and uh, resources that they can use in order to help them bring through. And again, this is not supposed to be something 
something that is a punishment. It's supposed to be a place where we're inviting them to release their emotions. And ideally, um, you know, if, if they can get that, that over the top foul frustration out, that we could get to the more softer side uh, and perhaps even get to the tears. So one of the things we're going to talk about is, uh, is the importance of play. So just a very quick summary about what's happening with play is when children are stirred up um, emotionally, their play actually can reflect the themes that they're struggling with. Um, one of our uh, uh, colleagues, Hannah Beach, wrote a wonderful article called My Son is Playing Corona Vet. Corona tag, uh, no, coronavirus tag. What's wrong with him? It seems rather macabre, but actually he and his friends were playing out the monster or whatever, how they can deal with that monster. Uh, there was a tornado in Gatineau and uh, one of the, uh, the teachers came up to me and, and let me know. She said, you know, my children have been playing tornado for the last three weeks. Well, they were playing out the experience that they had, all the different ways of doing that. It's naturally how children make sense of the world and of these experiences. And so pictures are drawn, structures are made, the games, the emotions come out in a way that feels safer. Because when those children were reenacting the tornado, there wasn't the actual tornado that was there, but they were reenacting all of the things that were happening to them and the emotions that they felt. And they could play it with their dolls in a way that, uh, that wasn't real. And play is like a bubble. It's a bubble in which um, it's not work, it's not for real, it's expressive, it's a safe place where you can do this, uh, you can freely choose to do it. So the children who wanted to play tornado played tornado, the ones who didn't want to play tornado didn't. So it's something that you choose to do and of course it engages you. Um, and, it, and again, we used to say it was fun, but not, they weren't playing something that was fun, but they were playing something that was real and engaging to them. What we need to recognize and understand uh, is that there's been this, we're, we're a little bit like the, uh, the, the frog in the pot, uh, you know, that heats up slowly and the, the frog does not realize that actually at the boiling point, it's going to be the end of his life. We've been doing the same thing with play. There is now people that are dedicating themselves to the study of play. David Elkin wrote a book called The Power of Play. And one of the things that, that has been noted is children have lost 12 hours of free time a week, including eight hours of unstructured playtime and outdoor activities. Of course, digital devices have not helped it, but nor have uh, many of the, the structured activities that we bring children to. So there's no longer a lot of these spontaneous games uh, that, that happen. Actually, I think one of the advantages of what's happened during COVID it, is that our children, just because we've not been able to give them the structure that we've before, they've been having to play a lot. And that, ha I think, has been one of the protective mechanisms. Uh, Stuart Brown noted, uh, and you'll notice that there is an encyclopedia devoted to the study of play. Outdoor play has decreased by 71% in one generation in the US and the UK. And what we need to recognize is that concurrent to that, there's been an increase as of 2016, one in six children ages two to eight years of age had a diagnosed mental, behavioral, or developmental disorder. What we're finding is with the diagnosis are escalating, depression, ADHD, other uh, anxiety has actually paralleled the loss of play. And so what we need to remember is that play is huge for us, especially in this time of emotion. It's essential. It's a work-free space, so children are not working for growth and development. It's a protection for feelings, because in that bubble, I can play out things that are concerning me, and it allows me to express what I need to express without repercussion. So in this next little while, one of the things we need to become more conscious about is how are we going to offer emotional playgrounds? Uh, and this is a very broad word, because we're including high school in this as well. But in our school, outside of school, and at home, uh, you know, outside, obviously, in, in daycare and at home, how can we offer more places for play to happen? Thank you, Eva. So if we want to look a little bit deeper into emotional playgrounds is, and, and yes, we are going to look at this for both elementary and high school and home, because these are all elements that, that we can bring out in these different areas. So having that laughter and humor and, and, and where can we, I mean, let's like hopefully naturally bring that in and, and, and that sense of enjoyment. 
Um, the drawing and the painting, if it can't, you know, some of that can be offered at school. Some of it might not always be available at school. And the key is really seeing where's the bent of the different kids and what are things that we can offer. Um, being able to provide that. I'm thinking for high school is, are there walls that could have murals? Um, and many high schools have already done this, but at, in a time of pandemic and returning and being able to have that expression, this could be an area that could be channeled. Drama and theater. I mean, if we go from young kids to dress up play um, of having things they can pick up and put on and, and they take on a different persona and what they share and they even just naturally change their voice and different walk and stance. But for the high school kids, the upper elementary and high school is, is for some of them, the vulnerability of sharing of themselves uh, in a conversation with people is too overwhelming and too vulnerable for them. But however, through a role and through um, a character, is they're able to work through and, and maneuver that in a, in a way that will be equally as helpful for them as it is the role they're putting on. But there will be that processing because that becomes an emotional playground. Dance and movement is a benefit to all. Being able to get some of that energy out of your body but through rhythm and movement and, and different types of music um, and having different focuses there. Singing and music, again, is, you know, at, at all levels, uh, the benefits of that and the intensity of it. I mean, those who are singers and, and, and enjoy music uh, will go into singing certain songs repeatedly. And some of them are singing at the top of their lungs. And, and, and can we provide lots of space? I had a, a colleague whose daughter was kindergarten and coming back from school and she was singing the song Shallows to the top of her lungs, but repeatedly. It was like stuck on repeat. And she says like, I'm dying here. Like this is doomed much what should I do and I was like buy sound reducing headphones for you your husband and your son because this is one of the healthiest things that she can be doing I mean this was even before COVID where the context of going to school keeping it together trying to do well for everything so we need to provide that time and space to make it safe but also not cut it out we need to be able to provide space and, and acceptance of, of different venues for kids so that we can encourage the expression. What we don't want is to stop it or stifle it with, oh, that's enough, I'm tired of that, because then that will just really cut out the whole energy. There's a huge part where we need to be able to step back, create the space and be observers. We actually don't need to do a whole lot of intervention here, but we do need to set the context for different things to be available so that that will help. Um, with dance and movement, I'm also seeing like for high school um, and even the upper elementary is having gyms available at lunch um, for sports pickup games. It doesn't need to all, I would actually, it would actually be better that it's not all structured. Um, if there are several gyms in the high school that, you know, some are just available for pickup games, materials are available, but students can go. That there's adult supervision so we know that things are safe, but that expression, that movement, that being able to do the spontaneity, what they're moved to, would be huge to be able to offer that. Um, irony and wordplay, slam poetry would be another one I would put in here, where there can be that huge expression within that those parameters in that context, and again, providing lots of space for that to come out. Stories and writing, some it'll be through doodling and through words and that coming through. Um, teasing and silliness, I don't know about you, but in my kitchen, a lot of silliness comes out and a lot of stressors come out and a lot of expression comes out and, and, and even drama <laughs> in the sense of like the day gets played out sometimes. And I have young adults and we've been, this has been a big piece in our house. The kitchen is a place to play um, you know we play in cooking but we play in in just kind of like offloading the day but to be able to have those parameters can really be helpful another area that could be interesting for upper elementary is photography um, to really be able to add that so that would be one that I would add here for some um, you know that would be an area of comfort that they can be showing their world their um, their feelings their emotions what they're living through their lens um, and having seen some work with high school students, um, some of what they put out is so interesting and so valuable. So those would be areas that I would strongly encourage. In addition to putting puzzles in there, I would put puzzles in as a way of 
switching gears, being able to uh, put order to your life, to be able to um, have that sense of pulling pieces together. Um, I, it's, it's an intervention that I've often recommended. At this point right now, I would actually recommend strongly that each classroom have a puzzle that is a community puzzle that is ongoing. Um, even at the high school level, I would gauge the number of pieces to the age group of the students. Um, but th that would be a, a real big asset piece to have of, of everything that puzzling can bring to people. I'd also recommend it for adults. We've at home over COVID have, have set up puzzles, which we haven't had in, in years. Um, and, and we've been working through 100 piece puzzles. Um, and it's just really been a really interesting experience. So as, as mentioned, and uh, we're looking at emotional expression without words. It doesn't always need to be words. Actually, a lot of our communication, 85% of our communication is non-verbally and through action. So how can we get some of that expression? And, and the key is drawing, I would say, big papers, painting big papers. Give it lots of space. Don't limit to it. Eight and a half by 11. Go big go big. Uh, if you have banner paper or something of the sort, I would go for that. Leave it out. If you can cover the surface of a table, even in a class, if that's an option that you have, you've got the space or you've got a wall surface that you can put up, I would do that. Strongly encourage you for that. Outside, I would go for that, uh, the, the, the sidewalk chalk. And this is something that I've really enjoyed seeing in our neighborhood during the whole time of COVID is kids outside playing, but also the sidewalk chalk and their creation. Some of them it's messages, some of them they're creating games and some of them it's the designs that they're doing. But the beauty of that and the expression that goes through it We want to look at taking frustration into play. There are a lot of frustrations of things we can't do, who we're missing, we can't see, I would want to do, can't go, this is canceled, a whole bit. Now things have come back more to normal. We can save some activities have picked up again, but it doesn't mean that everything's been possible. Um, and, and part of that is how can we play out these impulses to make things work? Uh, we want to help affect change. So anything that we can be looking at, constructing and crafts, um, I would even look at things like, you know, building through Legos, blocks, mazes, I'm going to say boxes, like build towers, man, uh, making things perfect. So I bring back our puzzles here, organizing and orchestrating. For high school here, if you have any access to woodworking, or making small projects or different kinds of things with wood, the steps of the cutting, the sanding, the making it smooth, the pulling it together, the figuring out, that would be incredible opportunities to channel a lot of energy and come out with something that they can use or they've created or can be put on display if they're comfortable with that, if they want that. But there's so much energy that could be worked through there. Uh, the emotions, it would be just amazing. Um, this would also help to reduce um, levels of frustration. We want to be taking, um, playing out the impulses to attack or to destroy. So destroying and demolishing, um, not that we want people going around destroying classes, but what are things that can, they can be making and taking apart? And the same thing for home is what can they make and take apart? Uh, we for years had, we would keep boxes in our garage and, and the kids would play with building towers. And sometimes it was more of a kicking or a punching, but the, the act of building was simply to bring it down, to tear it down. Um, the hitting and throwing, you know, of, you know, hitting tennis balls against a wall. What are different ways that we can get some of that attacking energy out so that it is without consequence. We're getting expression without consequence, but we're able to get the energy through and out of the system. We need to help reduce the intensity of the system. This here is very much uh, in the release and the venting area that Catherine mentioned. So kicking and screaming, playing games where they can get loud. Out. We want to get that out. Um, you know, with young kids, we would often play, you know, you know, who's the loudest bear and, and always continuously repeating, I can't hear you. Well, I remember bringing kids in, we had a special class and we would come in and by the time we finished playing this game, they needed popsicles for their throat. But you would have this reduction of intensity of frustration that they could actually sit and settle down and have a sense of calm after because we provided a way and a time for that to come out. So war games, attacking games, play fighting. 
that can all happen with a beginning and an end so that it is kept safe, but that we can provide that time and space where they're safe. Um, you know, playing with pool noodles here is a great asset. The only rule is no face, no head, okay? But if you can have access to a box of pool noodles, it's still the time to go out and buy them. I would strongly encourage that, even for staff. Okay, even for staff to go out and have some fun with that. So it helps to reduce levels of frustration. It decreases the aggression and violence in real life, which is really the, the whole piece that we want to work with. Now, some kids over COVID will have had lots of opportunities for play. They will have been playing out a lot of their emotions. They're going to be coming in with some level of frustration and alarm. Other kids are, will not have had those opportunities and they're going to be coming in fairly charged up. Our key will be in reading the levels of where kids are at and what can we put into place to help them. So we'll need to anticipate and then prevent and put things into place. But this is really key in helping them navigate through things that are different, things that have changed. Um, kids that are coming back to school know what school was like last year. And everything's gonna feel different. There's gonna be so many things that are different and so many no's. So how can we turn that around? But how can we get some of that energy to move? It needs to move. Think of the sine waves, because if it gets stuck, this is where we're gonna have more trouble. It needs to move. So we have a few suggestions here. You don't need to do note taking because we have all of these activities explained in the resource guide. But just to walk you through kind of the guiding principles of them and our thoughts with them is to really be looking at this. The group release activities would be activities to be done with a whole class group and that you could do at any point in time. And I would actually strongly encourage you to schedule um, some of these in, in, your, in the early weeks, but to have things go on regularly that you know you're providing a release venting time and that this becomes an investment in prevention to help reduce the intensity of, of, of the, the pressure that can build in the system with kids. Some kids, this won't be enough. They will need more. So think back to the RTI model. But for some, this will make a huge difference and this will help them through and be able to manage themselves and be able to do what you're asking them to do a lot more easily because pressure has been released in the system. Okay. So we want to set the stage. Um, activities can run smoothly if, if we're inclined to follow and they will be inclined to follow your lead if you do the following and, and part of it is right from the beginning is collecting them before you begin the activity. We need to make sure that everybody's on board, that you're getting their eyes, their smile, their nod, they know what's coming, they're hearing, they're listening to you and that we want to have them in queue with you because then they will follow you and then you can name the cues of how, you know, when it's going to begin and what are the cues that you're going to give when it's the end of the activity. If we want to help transitioning to go well, we need to give those cues at the get-go. And then one of the most important pieces, you need to join in, not be an observer. You need to join in and really develop a culture of enjoyment and encourage them to join in. Now, you may have some kids who at first are going to go, I'm not playing that game. This is stupid. I don't want to do this. You can't make me. And it's to say, well, you know, you can watch us. And when you feel you're ready, come on in because we're having fun. And I sure hope you decide to join us. And, and if we just do it as an invitation and you step in and you're having fun and kids are engaged with you, it will be really hard for them to not join in okay so make it enticing making it fun um, lots of laughs in there and it will really help things to like brew that rhythm to build and, and to go so some of the activities that we have, um, I'm not going to read through them all, but just to give you some pointers on each of them. The frustration monster is one that you want with a big sheet of paper. Uh, we're not looking to do a nice drawing to stay within the lines. This is where you want to go big, go wild, go dark, have a go at it, use some music with it, um, have fun with it. And, 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 you know, there is not to be uh, judgment on this. This is very much an open invitation of just get some of that out. But just the intensity of the rubbing and what they do and how big they spread will also help get some of that intensity out. The drumming is one that I absolutely love. Having been in, in a, a music class with a teacher at St. Lawrence, amazing. Teaching drumming on buckets, but you could also create your own drums. 
Um, very easy to do coffee cans. I have one that I keep on the side that I could easily see um, that we could transform, kids could bring in, uh, other people could provide, but building up uh, a range of instruments that you could have in your class that each has their own so they don't need to share them. But again, there is the intensity, the, the rhythm, the music, you can do it to music, you can create your own. I think there's pieces there where you can easily, if kids are becoming off task, having a hard time uh, focusing is you can switch to, you can switch to, um, you know, getting some movement and energy out to help the blood flowing, but just to get all of that, like to switch gears and get some of it out. Lots of fun can be had here. Be the conductor, you are the music. This is like a version, um, this is a, an activity that's written up by Hannah Beach. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a version of Simon Says with music and I would encourage you to do this outside. So there's lots of space, space to spread, lots of space for movement. Um, get silly, have fun. And again, this is that opportunity to get the movement out and outside so that the, you don't need to stay within a bounded space. With the parameters with social distancing when kids are in the hallways and with the teachers is this is a way where everybody will have space, but in a fun way. And that's really the key piece and have fun with the music, you know, get a good, a nice day and get out there with the music. Um, the squeeze away is, is another activity that I would encourage with big wide banner paper, uh, spray painting. I've seen this done on snow also in the winter, which is really nice to see. But the banner paper could become like a backdrop for bulletin boards. So here's a way where kids can contrib contribute, have that sense of belonging where we have worked together to put this in our class and to really put in some whole bunch of flashing colors. So get creative there. But again, is that getting it out and pushing, pushing, pushing. Um, is again another, just another angle of putting some energy out. I would encourage you to provide materials for play and to have a range of things within your classroom. Like some of these are, are pretty obvious. Um, the key would be to have, because we're looking at, kids are staying within groups um, and that they, they were looking, we need to minimize how much sharing of materials is done. So having things on display or a, a section where they could take things and then put them in a large Ziploc bag and hold on to them could be a way to manage this. And I think this is one of the key things is to look at what were things that we were doing before that we can adapt to how we can do them now. We, there are many things that you as teachers and, and educators in, in daycare were doing different things, activities with kids, and that you need to not let go of everything because of COVID, but to say, that was really helpful. This really worked. How can I adapt it to be able to make it happen now? Because you had a lot of practices and ideas and creativity that was amazing. And you want that to carry through. That it doesn't need to become bland because we're in the time of COVID. We need to look at how can we create that and make that happen and so that we can enjoy those things. Um, again, I've mentioned the large pieces of paper. I would encourage you, and especially upper elementary and high school, is for students to have sketchbooks. And I would be as bold to say the thick 100 page sketchbooks. Reason being that we want the hem them to have lots of space to put out their emotions, to express. Some will draw, some will doodle, some will write. That's okay, whatever it is. The key there is that when there's a need, that is a form of expression. They don't have to share unless they choose to. But the fact that we're even providing that venue is huge. Um, I've used this with many students and it's been quite amazing. With older kids in high school, I would encourage if you have an art teacher that can do a little, can do some uh, workshops, and I would put it by choice there that there's some trying out of sketching techniques with different kinds of pencils, different density of lead, um, and, and I would try that out because that could really help them take off in their expression as they're practicing techniques, but that might just really give it a whole flow for that emotional expression to come out. Play-Doh for younger kids is a huge piece of sometimes they need something in their hands to keep them busy, but to manage themselves and to manage their hands. Um, there's lots of recipes on the internet that you can make your own, and there every child could have in a Ziploc their own with their name on it. Um, I would strongly encourage making um, 
a range of instruments from rain sticks to drums to the tambourines and maracas and having those in your class so you've got your own little mini orchestra but those are venues and tools that you can use when you need to prime emotional expression that there's a variety so we can keep it stimulating and interesting we don't want things to get boring and to repeat the same thing over and over again because that would just cause frustration and 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 possibly trigger counter well if they're not interested because they're like you can't make me i'm not doing this but if you've they've got choices of which instrument they can play whichever instrument you've just worked around the counter wheel and getting them on board to being able to do this we want strongly encourage play with them this is a piece where we want them to see you in action the more that you play with them and are playful it will increase the attachment with you it'll bring them into orbit with you so you want to be getting their eyes their smiles their nod because the more that they're in orbit with you they will want to do for you and we know that mutual joy and shared communication will prime the attunement and we really want to help that and this also helps to regulate the body's stress response where it just brings it down the play helps it to flow and then it brings down the stress response one of the key pieces playtime should not be earned Playtime should be scheduled and it should be protected. Playtime is like having a very important appointment in your agenda that you are going to do everything to get there, to be there on time, and that you would not cancel. It's important. It's a need. Playtime is not a luxury. The kids who need it the most often lose it if we make it conditional on good behavior, on getting work done, on completing things, on tidying up. They need playtime even more. So we need to be careful that we are not falling into a rabbit hole of if you haven't done X, Y, Z, you can't get to playtime. Those kids even need it even more. And everybody right now needs it a whole lot. So there's a part where in your schedules in the upcoming weeks, we would strongly encourage you to put different periods of emotional expression activities and playtime because this is part of how kids will work through all the emotions that they're living and they're experiencing right now. We need to give it a venue to come through. So here we have lots more examples, the singing and the music, the dancing, all kinds, go different kinds of music, play it up, miming and dress up, being scary, being a monster. For some kids, the energy they will put out there playing the role will be the piece that will help them take out some of the edge that is too vulnerable for them to share or too scary to face. But if they put on a mask, if they put on a cape, they put on a something that will help them move into that direction to, to be able to express. And the key here is, is not that we are saying now we're going to do X, Y, Z. It's providing the conditions and to have things of available for them that their energy will move them to go in those directions for that expression to come out um, with drawing it would be the same thing all kinds of drawings not just one have a range variety different tools that they can use um, play fighting will also be a way for things to come out play with them I mean some you know some parents some dads in particular are really good at this and how beneficial that is um, I, I used to not do play fighting but I used to play tickle attack when we came home from school it would be tickle attack and I'm going to tickle you and then I'm going to or, or we'd play to hug attack and it's like I'm going to run after you and hug you and hold you till you know so parents at home there's a benefit there where you go into the chase the pursuit the laughter but the holding on till they're squeaming and wanting you to release but they need that as a as that playful energy and having fun and switching gears from them um, building and imagining let them go and create and try and make things out I would be amazed to see the ranges. I wonder how many homes did fort building during COVID. I know Catherine's daughter did that and they had a fort in their basement for, for quite a while. But the changes and the transformations, you might lose your living room over it or your TV room, but transformations of those are really interesting to see how they live and go into their, their imaginary world with it. And they're processing, jumping and destroying, get lost. I mean, trampolines, any kind of jumping have fun with it um, destroying well i don't mean destroying things that are good but i mean things you know building things up that they can have come down 
uh, you know, piles of boxes, different things. I've seen kids do all kinds of things around our neighborhood. And it's just interesting to see that happen and to flow and to try, move it through. Absolutely. Um, outdoor playgrounds, outdoor play. Um, some of our yards and, and depending on where your school is, if you've got this beautiful, massive green playground, please go out and use that and maximize that. Um, set up games, adapt games so that you can, you know, uh, kids can be getting lots of energy out. Um, some of our schools have very tiny playgrounds. It's asphalt within, you know, fenced areas for safety because it's streets all around. Um, do what you can with outdoor play. But if you're a parent of a child uh, in school, uh, it's, it's equally good for them to get out to play as it is for us to get out in nature and, and to bring them through that, whether you're going for a bike ride or you're going for a walk, but get kids and we need to also as adults get out there and get some fresh air and get moving. So I strongly encourage you uh, in the upcoming weeks to, to kind of be in that kind of a rhythm for yourself, because the more that we are in a good place, then the more that we are offering that to kids. So um, setting the conditions for, for all of this to come together. Martin, just in conclusion of your section, if you could uh, speak to very briefly about yep. um, sporting activities. There was a comment about that. I thought it was a good segue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that sports are really good and we want kids involved in sports and getting some energy out. Uh, we want them, you know, enjoying and, and putting energy out. So the key is not just in a, a, a team sport, because for some that works really well for them, others need more. Um, but any kind of physical activity, and the purpose is simply enjoyment, you know, and I would even orchestrate like with some kids who are less active um, and uh, are, are more prone to technology, I would make like, we're going to bike to the grocery store to get whatever for dessert tonight. But it's like, you know, even if it seems like a bit of a bribe, it's okay. That bike ride will be helpful. And if we do that repeatedly, it gets to not being hard to getting them out. But any sporting activity, the movement, the getting out, the challenge, the, the working through, absolutely, I would strongly encourage it. And anything that parents can join in with kids, even if you're not good at it, it's okay. You know, go out and have fun with it. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Martin. You're welcome. Uh, and, and so in this section, now we're referring to that middle part of the ITI model. Uh, and so looking at uh, playing out the emotions. Um, one of the things that I would mention here is that there's no need for adults to intervene or to interfere or to suggest or to set up for children. These are things that really happen naturally on their own. Um, play is, is really nature's solution to emotion, whether it's alarm or frustration um, and allows for the vent. And so you see examples here of, of alarm at play. Uh, and so going back to um, Eva's example of coronavirus tag, uh, playing monsters, being the monster, pretending to be scared. I remember I had a client of mine, her son um, went through something and just played time and time again in a loop, um, tornadoes and monsters. And to the point where, uh, you know, boys and girls in, in the classroom were so fed up of playing with him because that's all he wanted to play. Um, and, and, you know, at that point he ended up playing it on his own and it was okay. You know, like sometimes we wonder, do we need to set this up? Do we need to get kids to play that together? Is it okay that they're playing with this by themselves? And so um, we really need to take a step back and to kind of let things unfold on their own. I think children naturally do this because they need to do it. Um, and there's some of these types of play too. Um, Eva, slide you know, that might be uh, more uh, destabilizing for us as adults to see play out, like playing dead or playing orphan uh, or, or, you know, these types of games. And then we're, we're uncomfortable in thinking that we need to stop it because, you know, it's not a good thing. Maybe it's a mental health issue or something of that sort. And not at all. Um, you know, th there's a place and time for this. And, and to children need, uh, you know, even though it seems very dark, uh, you know, and, and, and um, and almost disturbing to some degree to us uh, on some level, um, you know, th there's a place for this. Same thing with fairy tales. How many of you have been exposed as children to the grim uh, uh, stories? Um, and, and so they're there for that reason. Um, and so, yeah. Um, the, the other thing that's really interesting uh, about play is that, yes, on the one hand, it's there for you to play out your emotions, uh, but on the other hand, it's also there to help you discover yourself as you're playing it through. Um, for example, courage. 
you know, to discover that even though it was really scary and that it was really difficult to, to attack that monster or to be that hero um, that, that you won at the end and that you made it through and that you survived it and that you're okay. Uh, and so you get to discover yourself. Um, and so there's wonderful, wonderful attributes uh, to play. And so, yes, on the one hand, the release piece and the expression of the emotion, but also the discovery of yourself and, and of your strength and courage. Catherine, I would add here that yeah. for high school, even high school, the drama, the plays, the very emotional role yes. will have the same impact. So sometimes we think of it as kids with masks and things, but we really need to be thinking also for the high school kids, this would also play out in the same way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for clarifying that. No, I just um, wanted to add. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, that's okay. Um, and so uh, in terms of, of stories, and you know, I was talking earlier about the grim tales. Um, and so for some children, the, the it, it is, it, or, or teenagers, it's difficult to, even us as adults, it's difficult to address our own lives straight on because it can be vulnerable, it can be overwhelming or wounding. And so um, taking it one step removed, taking it through a character, taking it through a story, through a movie, um, you know, telling stories, um, this could be a way for, for your brain to be able to let out all of this pent up emotion and, and it's doing it in a very non-threatening way because it's not necessarily directly about you. But the beautiful thing about our brain is that even though we're not addressing us directly, it's still therapeutic and it still allows for the emotion to work its way out. Um, you know, our, our, our brains are mechanical in that way. And so it's the same thing with tears. You know, think about us as adults when we've had a really rough week and we've watched a sad movie and all of a sudden we have like much more tears than we thought we would have. Um, and then we feel so much better after, we feel relieved. Um, and, and so even though, you know, we were crying about that, that character in the story, um, um, it, it does it does um, release for our, ourselves too. Uh, and so these are just examples of books that we love, love, love. Uh, we've got them out on our website. There's many more there. Um, you know, for example, a good to timing would be Alexander with his terrible, horrible day, uh, you know, and, and showing that uh, that all of us have these very bad days uh, and that we're able to relate to that and, and to see how the character kind of worked it through. Uh, and so uh, stories are, uh, you know, a playground for emotion. Uh, and, and they're also there to help release the tears. Uh, tears are, are such a tricky, tricky thing. Some people, uh, you know, have a, an easier time uh, letting go of their tears. I know my daughter is, is you know, I'm, I'm so happy for her and proud of her that she's capable of being so in touch with her her tears they come out so easily and, and other people like myself it's just ugh, you know it's just here at your at your and you know in your gut and it just it won't come out um and and so sometimes just having it through one step removed it ma just makes it that much safer um and uh and and that there isn't a judgment there um ar around it um, and of course, the other piece too is that, you know, sometimes, and I mentioned this earlier about us wanting to fix things and about us wanting to make the child feel better and they're there and, and you know, you know, you need, it's okay, you don't have to cry or giving them the Kleenex to wipe the tears really quickly. And, and so understanding that, that it, those tears are necessary and there's a place for them. Um, and it's a very healthy and necessary thing. Um, and understanding that tears are part of the adaptation process. Um, you remember the traffic circle that I, ha I had shown with the frustration coming down the pike and that, you know, there's a releasing vent, the venting and the release part, but at, at the middle part, there's the adaptation piece. Uh, and so adaptation, understanding that it's an emotional process. It's so, and it's not something where you're going through something that's not working for you. And then you might just change up your mind and say, oh, that's okay. It's not working and let's move on. It's not a rational thing. It's not a cognitive thing. It's an emotional thing. And so you need to move through through the, the frustration of it not working for you and then realizing and accepting the fact that there's, there's a blockage and that you're not going to make it change. Um, and so that disappointment and the moving through, oftentimes there, there's tears that can come with that, but it doesn't necessarily have to be tears in themselves. I think disappointment, uh, even a sigh, you know, the side, it's not going to happen. It's not going to work. And so you could see that that transformation is, it happens there. And the, the brilliant thing about adaptation is that 
in that moment when we're frustrated and we're not able to affect that change, we're only focused on that one door, that one place where we're trying to get through and we can't. And when we're moved through and that we have our, our tears or our disappointment, all of a sudden we see a whole other slew of, of opportunities that we just couldn't see before. Um, and so this is the process. This is the journey of the tears, uh, you know, of the grieving and understanding that, you know, when, we when we're sad, when we have our tears or when we're grieving of something, it's not a, a downward spiral that never ends. It's not an abyss. And understanding that emotions have a wave and so they have a beginning and an end and that they're able to come down, um, you know, with whatever it is that's not working for us and having those tears and that the tears or the disappointment allows for the, ah, oh, we feel better and we've got that bounce back that comes out, uh, you know, and so, and so making the space for the wave to make its way through. Um, and understanding the difference between coping and adaptation, they are not the same thing. Of uh, coping is something that can be, uh, you know, helpful and necessary at times where we just need to, you know, buckle up and we need to get through something. And so we kind of push down, remember that valve that Eva was talking about, we push down those, those um, feelings to be able to power through, uh, but understanding that this isn't something that we can do, um, you know, on a long-term basis. First of all, it's exhausting, but more so, remember I was talking about the side effects of that with the depression of emotion and the displacement of emotions. At some point, the emotions need to get out. And so adaptation, um, you know, is, is different from coping because it's not about suppressing it, it's about releasing. And so adaptation can be something that's very noisy, it could be something um, that, that fr from an outside perspective, when we don't understand the place of tears or the place of sadness of, of emotion, we can get destabilized or awkward or uh, uncomfortable with it. But when we understand their place, we realize that no, it's actually quite healthy and, and, and it allow, allows for the child to build that resilience. And so uh, going hand in hand, what, what I was just saying, you know, having that, that philosophy of the right thinking, you know, just thinking positively, being grateful about, you know, focusing on what we should be grateful about, resisting to, to go down to the, to the disappointment and the sad, sadness, focusing on, you know, what's important here is the calmness and the tranquility. Again, we're, we're working against the emotion here. You could see in that picture, the little guy is trying to work backwards into that natural flow of emotion. Not that there's no place for this at all. It is okay, you know, to, to, to focus on the positive sometimes and to be grateful about things, but this could not be our, our, our mode of operation at all times. There needs to be a place and time for there to be the release. And so, of course, adaptation, uh, you know, sometimes needs that little nudge. You know, some people very naturally can, can move through their, their, their emotion and have the adaptation on their own. And other people need to have that safe place and that safe person to, to, to just kind of wrap them and then be able to soften and to get to those tears. We, you know, I'm sure you guys recognize some of those uh, students uh, that have a harder time that are more into the aggression, more into the attack. And so those are the, those children who need that safe person or that safe place. And so how can we as adults help for those tears to flow? Um, and so a, a way that we could go about this is to reflect, first of all, to reflect on the emotion. Sometimes we're, we're, we, we, we stay stuck in our head where we focus on what happened or who said what to who, who started it, who finished it. And so it's not about the situation or the content and trying to move away from our head and move more towards our heart and to reflect on the emotion. For example, the frustration, Th this didn't work for you. That's not what you had in mind. You know, and, and it's all in the way that you say it in the tone and the, and the, and the pace that you're, you know, when you're speaking to the child, um, that must have been really scary. You weren't sure what was going to happen. Um, you really uh, wanted for them to like you. Um, and so matching the emotion that us and ourselves and the way that we're conveying it to them, that we too kind of mirror how they're feeling in that moment. Um, and then subtly we move to the sadness, but being careful that this is not a too overt type of agenda, because if kids know that this is what we're trying to get at, that we're trying to get them to the tears, the tears are just going to go right back in. And so trying to be really careful about making a very subtle type of way. Silence is really important here. 
Eva, if you'd like to, thank you. Uh, silence is really important here. Again, if, we're, if we start focusing on the why, first of all, children don't always know why, we, why they're, they're upset, neither do we. And, and if we start focusing on the why, uh, we get distracted and then we're back into our head. Um, and, and, and so that could move away from the tears, but more so sometimes it might make them feel like whatever it is that, th that they're upset about, that it's not worth the emotion. Uh, and it's not that we meant to do that, but it's how the child might interpret it. And so, you know, I know how well-meaning, you know, all of you are and that we want to get to the heart of the matter and that we want to address things, but try to bite your tongue, try to sit there very quietly with compassion. Um, I had the question yesterday from someone who asked, um, you know, how, how silence can sometimes make things awkward. Um, and so um, the answer to that was that there's different types of silences. Remember that with your body language, there's so much that we're saying through our body language that might not be through our words with the warmth in our eyes, that, you know, the twinkle, the, 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 you know, just the body presence. Silence can actually be very satisfying and very heartwarming and very, war you know, um, and wrapping for somebody, it doesn't mean that silence is necessarily awkward. And so resisting for us to be that alpha that is trying to, uh, to take over um, and trying to problem solve, trying to, you know, just being there and just letting things kind of naturally unfold. Um, and so understanding, you know, when we understand how emotions work, um, you know, if we do leave time and space for this, that this will then allow uh, the flowing of emotions when then allow children to grow, grow in the moment, but also grow on, on, a, on a longer uh, point. I remember, Eva, you had added something yesterday. I will let you add on uh, again to that today. Thanks, Catherine. Mm -hmm. um, yes, well, I think, uh, uh, again, I, I don't have a script here, but I know what's, what's coming to my mind right now, again, is that uh, we're all concerned about the, uh, the amount of academics that our children have, have just not engaged in in the last little while. And we're talking a lot about, about the children being behind. But again, what we, two things we need to know is that, first of all, in that time, uh, since March, the brain has continued to grow. And in fact, many of our children have engaged more in play than they ever have in a long time, simply because there wasn't anything else to do. And so really, um, especially what we know about the brain, there's the right hemisphere, which is really the problem solving part of the brain, the comprehension part of the brain. It needs lots of experiences to grow and develop. So we are teaching skills in our school and academics, but if that part of the brain that understands the bigger picture has had a chance to grow and develop, the actual teaching of academics is not as difficult. And so we have to have faith in the developmental process. We have to have faith in the fact that uh, the children are coming to us actually in some respects further ahead than they were before, not in terms of specific skills, but in terms of their overall development. And then the other piece we need to understand is that if we can help the emotions to flow, and I think based so what we've done today is we've tried to share with you all the different ways in which you in a classroom not being a therapist, not being, you know, a psychologist, but in a classroom working with your kids, things that you can do that will actually help them. And when they are calmer, as Martin mentioned, when the system is calmer, the brain is open. And so maybe in the first month, maybe September, maybe in October, you won't be doing as much academics as you would like to do, but you need to take that pressure off of yourself work with the emotions and actually you will open up some little windows of learning and the learning will happen. Once all the dust has settled and we don't know when that's going to settle, um, we will have a chance to catch up. I've worked all my life with not only children but also with adults who came to learning specific things very later in their life and they could learn them when they were ready to learn them. So we need to have faith in that developmental process. Take care of the important things that need to be taken care of and right now the most important thing that needs to be cared about is emotions, but also trust that when we take care of emotions, we're taking care of, of children's growth and development. So we want you to remember that in this difficult time, you are not alone. Uh, through the Center of Excellence for Behavior Management, we are here with you as you, we've given these workshops, these will be available on recordings on our website. So when, uh, if you want to listen to them again, or if you want to share this with your colleagues, with your spouse, with your friends, with whoever you want to share them, they will be there to share with you. We've provided um, different kinds of resources. Uh, we have uh, the resource guide 
uh, where we have the um, description of the activities that Martine talked about, some articles that were written uh, to help, again, just talk again about the rationale for why we're talking about what we're talking about. We gathered as much as we could in French. It's not perfect, but as much as we could in French for those of you who read more easily in French. Um, I also want to mention the, um, the Center of Excellence for Mental Health. Uh, throughout COVID times, they were creating all sorts of materials and support materials for parents, for teachers, and so on. So go to them, refer to them as well. Um, and so just know that there are people here in the province who are thinking about you, who want to support you, who want to help you in this very, very difficult, challenging time. So you are, you are not alone. This afternoon and again tomorrow morning, we will be, be presenting a Lead Play Learn, where we're giving more practical hands-on ac activities and things that you can do in the classroom. It's more appropriate to elementary and early secondary, but those of you that are working in later secondary, you're very welcome. There might be some nuggets in there for you as well. Um, there's still time to register. You just go to our website and, and register there for the dates that, uh, for even as late, even for this afternoon, if you're able to do it. If not, again, this will be on our website. So visit our website. We're going to be updating it, putting new things on. Uh, we're also hoping um, that as uh, that through the fall, and again, we're being very trying to be respectful of the fact that schools will be very highly engaged in trying to manage a very challenging situation. But on the other hand, uh, we also want to keep supporting you. So we're thinking about doing short one hour uh, presentations, things that we can do, explanations, uh, highlighting certain things. So um, as time goes on, do you know, keep coming back to our website and uh, we will be sending out emails as best we can to everybody, but sometimes it's a bit of a challenge. So, so uh, sign up and, and, or, and come to our website and just find out what we're doing to support you. And we hope that, uh, that you have found this, this helpful to you. So I will stop sharing here. You Perfect. I think we could also mention that on the website, there is a special tab with all of the resources that we've gathered and created um, during the coronavirus period. And there's a subsection for schools and there's another subsection yeah. for parents. So those are all pieces and information that can be shared with other colleagues also. So feel free to go have a look at those. Many, I mean, basically everything is available to you, downloadable and also online pieces that we have done during that time. That could be yes. helpful. And, and as much as we possibly can, we also have that in French as well, but it's not 100%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And then recently, Eva offered uh, a presentation online in the evening for parents. Uh, we should be getting the recording of that uh, hopefully soon. And so we, that will be available as well. Great. Well, um, okay. we have a little bit of time for questions and comments. So if you have any and have not yet posted them, please do so in the chat. And Catherine, I don't know if there's a few that you want to. Uh, well, there's to a couple attention. that we've replied to already, but there's one where, where is it? Um, let me see. Hmm. Oh, here. Uh, I'm confused about how to organize the children playing in the kitchen corner. Well, I think right now, I mean, the, the, the playing in itself, if centers are used, I mean, I think everything will need to be disinfected after groups, like certain kids play in clusters. So I think that's a piece. Um, I think we could take it more on the angle of at home and, and being playful in the kitchen. Um, high school, some have a home ec course and there's cooking that goes on, then items would be by some groups. But the being playful in the kitchen can be a, a fun way of just um, being able to um, maneuver and, and just get silly, but also be creating and making things and giving kids space for choices of things that they like to do. A new question. I would question. actually go into pizza oh. making, pizza making, cookie mm. making, uh, without using a hand mixer so that they can be getting lots of that energy out. I would really go into that, some of those pieces like that. Somebody asks, what other consequences would you suggest if we do not take away playtime? Oh, I think right now, and I'm going to be very, very frank with you. Right now, I think, uh, and again, um, if you have the opportunity to come and listen to our session on Lead, Play, Learn, um, our biggest push that we're saying right now is that at the more we can manage behavior by 
getting keeping kids out of trouble. Um, it's really about managing the environment, not managing the children so much. I understand that this usually works quite well, um, not only for the child who's got difficulty, but for the other children. If we say to them, no, you need to get your work done before you can go play, mo you know, 70% of your children are going to go, oh my goodness, yes, of course, and then they're going to work really, really hard. Um, and, and again, it's, it's very difficult because you know that if you say to one child who hasn't worked really hard, you get to go play. They'll, well, I didn't want to work. This is, this is just one of those things that I think overall understanding that, that play is going to be important. So you might say, if the other children are saying, he didn't finish his work, why does he get to play? I've decided what work he needs to get done. And, and you're going to find that most of the children are going to keep working hard, but right now we have to understand how important playtime, and as Martine said, uh, said earlier, a very apart in the resistance, I know that you want to be seen as the person who's in charge in your classroom. And you can just say, you know what, I've decided right now, we've all worked so hard that we all need to play. And just take the thing off. And, and you'll find as we get through this emotional time, you're going to find that actually many of the children, if they get to play, especially if you have fun with them, they're going to want to please you even more. Mm -hmm. And so it's really less about managing individual behavior in a moment and trying to set the conditions so that we can get through our day. Again, this is maybe a bit more specific and, and we can maybe try and, and do a session on that, but I hopefully this answers the question a little bit. Eva, I would just add that in those in, in those time frames and in that circumstance, that child may not have the capacity to do the work. Not just of not an issue just of knowledge, but the ability to attend, to focus and to follow through, to mm. even hold on to that. If the alarm is so high, they can't function and focus. I've seen adults who are not able to follow through on two, three stepped instructions who are usually very on the ball, on the go, and they're dropping pieces. So if this is happening to adults, we need to have mm. a huge amount of compassion for kids and teens because it's not an issue of just, I don't want to, it's I can't. And sometimes they're not even realizing that what they're doing looks like they're not trying. It's not an issue of not trying, they can't. It's not they won't, they can't. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think we need a lot of compassion there. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a question here, a comment slash question. As a science, uh, a science and technology teacher, I, th I thought that students could break apart and rebuild electronics is it necessary that the electronics function properly when they are rebuilt? Will it cause frustration if, if they don't function? A beautiful question. <laughs> I love of course, it. <laughs> yeah, of course it will cause frustration if it doesn't work because that's what they want. But you know, again, this is as much about, I think, again, how we set the, the framework is that, you know what, guys, we're going to try the best we can and then remind them that, you know, and I can't remember, I'm going to just throw a name out here. Steve Jobs, you know, tried 75 or 100 different things before he got his computer to work the way he wanted. That's fine. All the mistakes. Okay. Because it, it's the action and the activity that's important. And again, we need to remember in this time of COVID, we are really moving away from performance uh, mm -hmm. and moving into process. Uh, mm -hmm. We just need to keep doing things with our children because they need to, they need to have a sense that the adults are there caring for them. If we put the agenda in our mind, they have to accomplish something. We're going to put a lot of pressure on ourselves and on them. And right now, accomplishment isn't the goal. It's maintaining. Mm -hmm. It's keeping us all together. It's getting us this, through this and, and getting ourselves through it as well, you know, and so uh, do the best you can and, and, and name the frustration when it happens. But you know oh, what? Yeah. And, I, I, and I would name the parallel also of, you know what, in life, sometimes we do things and we thought, man, that was going to be easy. It was going to work. And it bombed. That's okay. Some things just bomb. They don't work. You thought it was going to happen. Didn't happen. You order something. They say it's going to be in two days, 11 days later, you still don't have it. Oh, well. So there's a part where it mimics real life where sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And adaptation is, oh, well, there's nothing I can do about it. So let's move on to the next thing. And mm -hmm. I feel my sadness. I'm disappointed, but pff, do I collapse? Do I attack? No. Can I just move through it? and survive through it. It's okay. You tried your best. It didn't work. Good effort. Mm -hmm. Move on. Yeah. And you know what? At the same time, I, I see this as a wonderful, op a wonderful opportunity for them to be able to let out some of this frustration that might be happening in other places of their life that they can't let yeah. out. And this will allow for all of the frustration to move through. I actually think it's brilliant because I, I, yeah. you're setting it up for them to be able to release. 
Yeah. Uh, so I would Catherine, encourage this activity. Yeah. yeah, Catherine, this makes me think of some of the wood projects that we've done with yes. students where, you know, like the, the, the using a angle box with a handsaw and needing to sand and then like screwing things in. And it's like some kids never knew these tools. And, yep. and then, the, but the effort it takes, some of them were breaking a sweat and they're going, this is a lot of hard work, you know, miss. And, and, but it's also, you know, fun things, good things don't always come easy. It's okay. Yep. But the process and the pride coming through of trying it out and, and sometimes mm -hmm. something's totally bombed. They collapsed after. They didn't hold. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. The other thing yeah. too with high school, um, one of the suggestions is that uh, that we you know we create a spot where, like you've got a lot of, you know, you're really frustrated now, you want to let it out. What are some ways we can let it out? And, and, you know, sometimes writing it down, all the horrible words we have in our head, we write it down into a book. Nobody can see it. Um, sometimes we might, uh, you know, um, I know that uh, sometimes we need to go somewhere and just let it all out, let those words out. And, and coaching high school students as to where we can do that, how we can do that, what's an appropriate way. Um, it's, that won't it's lead a bit to consequences. Challenge. That yeah. won't lead to consequences, yes. And I know a lot of the guidance counselors and, and special behavior, uh, behavior technicians and support people in high schools, very often, their, often is, their, their office is a safe swear, swearing place, you know, where the, there isn't, is a, you need, to, you, need, you need to let it off your chest right now. I'll, I'll plug my ears, go ahead and let it out. And then, and then you know, we'll talk yeah. about it afterwards. Because mm -hmm. if you don't let it out, I think, Catherine, that, that picture that you showed of where it's all pushing in, and it'll either, either push in and stay in, yeah. or it'll push in and it'll come out somewhere else. Sometimes yeah. we need to give a place for this stuff to come out. And there was a, a, an idea in the past where we thought, well, if we, if we let it out, we're just encouraging that behavior. But I don't know about the rest of you, but you know, I don't swear very much at all. But once in a while, I get really, really frustrated and I feel like I want to swear. And you know, I will let those words out, but I'll do it in my bathroom where no one can hear. Um, and so I let them out. And, and I don't swear more as a result of it. In fact, usually I, I, I have a whole lot less need to say those words once I've said them out loud in a place that isn't hurting somebody else. So we call that venting. Uh, and um, mm -hmm. it's very important that even for ourselves that we leave a place, find people with whom we can let out our frustrations um, and, and just let them know you don't have to fix anything. Just listen to me. And just let it out and in a way that doesn't hurt somebody else. And, and mm -hmm. so, it's, yeah. Big, so there's a there's a question here. Sometimes I, I see a child in the playground or in the classroom during free time that chooses not to play. How can I encourage them to join in with the others naturally? Well, I would I actually would think that if they're not playing with the others, there's something going on that they need to, to deal with themselves because play is not just about playing with other children. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be that this child is, is daydreaming, thinking of a story. Now, again, we have to be sensitive to the children that are being rejected by the other children. That's a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. But if they truly do, don't feel comfortable, they just might need a little bit of a bubble, a quiet space away from other people. Um, playing with other people isn't the only kind of play. There are many other kinds of play. I've also seen in situations like that, Eva, is if we approach the child with, if, if they're not inclined to play, is there something they would like to do or that would help them? Mm -hmm. And often a handcraft or something they can do individually that is theirs will often be something that they will go to. But it also then becomes a sign when they naturally go to that, that that's what, they're need, that's what they need. And then you also see times because they have the option of that or the joining in, that there are times that they join in. But the key piece is, is that we're not pushing them to join in. It's that they are given choices Think of that emergence where you offer choices of if not this, then what? And that we, you know, we, we gently have that conversation, but that we not put pressure. You don't have to play with others. Um, we don't always want to be with others. And if you're in with groups a lot, and we need to also consider that coming through the time where kids have been at home, most likely they have not been around groups of kids. They're mm. going to find, some kids are going to find this too many people, too mm. loud, and there's too many things to do. And, I, and like, it's just too much around me. So mm. some of them are going to need their bubble in a quiet time. We're going to be speaking to that in the Lead, Play, Learn uh, presentation this afternoon. But more times of, sometimes kids just need that we allow for that bubble to be. So then they're able to, when you come back to the group activity or the next piece after that transition, that they mm -hmm. are able to rejoin. 
For sure. And then the other piece too, I think to keep in mind is when we're talking about emotional playgrounds, you know, there's a traditional sense of play, but then, you know, children might be like you were, you were saying Eva daydreaming and in their own minds and they're actually playing, but it just, it's just more subtle and it's not as obvious. And so, you know, paying attention to that too, asking the child what it is that, that they're thinking about or, or, you know, um, and sometimes they just need their kind of bubble time. Mm -hmm. Good. So there's no other questions. I don't know if there's anything else. No, I think we're uh, at the end, eh? Yes, we're, and we're going to let people, I know that many of you are eager to go back to your classrooms, to go back to the preparation that you're making for the school year. I uh, just want to, again, thank you. Thank you for being there for our children, thank for so being willing to consider another way of being with them, of adding a whole other piece in, consciously into your classroom. All of you have done this. This mm -hmm. is not something new to you, but something that you're now consciously going to add in, uh, consciously going to be thinking about a different way of being, but you have the capacity to do it. Uh, you are the people that children are looking to, um, and, and, you, and you're able to do that. And then, again, many uh, one of the interesting things that we found is that that the people that are coming to these presentations are also your school board consultants. We did a session uh, last week for your school board administrators. So you have many people at your school boards um, who are getting the sim similar similar message and they'll be able to support you in this. They know how to do this. They can help you with it. And so you're not alone. And we hope that we've been able to inspire you. We hope that we've been able to, to perhaps lessen a little bit of the alarm that you're feeling naturally and give you the courage and the strength to go and be the people that your children need you to be. Thank you, everybody. So, yeah, a lot of appreciation, inspiring. Some people mm -hmm. are saying enjoyed the session. Some people are coming back this afternoon. Great. Have a good lunch. We'll see you later. <laughs> All right.